we are live. Why is it out of focus? Ah, crap. Oh, I think we're in focus. This is 2000's Fortress 2 Review and Thoughts film, Re-Entry. I just want to start off by briefly pointing out this actually was theatrically released. In some countries, it technically wasn't direct-to-video, despite what you might have heard. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, so, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. and. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for the first movie. As soon as, and as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. So, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing at least some of the following of the potential triggering content that this movie features. Torture, ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, xenophobia, body horror, and yes. So, this movie was rated R, and so is this video. Now, yeah, I'm just really briefly going to, I thought this was a really great Critics quote, the film's combination of sex, humor, and violence looks like a cynical attempt to capitalize on the unsophisticated juvenile video market. And they gave it a 1 out of 4. Now, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. I mean, I'll know. I mean, I won't know. Of course, I won't know, because the the implant that taps into the optic nerve is busted. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the first movie in the series. I am going to criticize that, yes, but I would not think higher of the movie if I hadn't watched the first one. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, in order to follow this movie's plot, you have to have watched the first movie. As already mentioned, the first time I watched this movie, it was fairly new, so I will not be criticizing it for not living up to the standards of 2021. And if I only watched it today for the first time, I would still be trying not to criticize it for that. I suppose I, that deserves brief clarification. I believe I said in my video on The First Fortress that I also watched the sequel, this movie, close to when it came out. That's why I realized I hadn't said it before in this video. Since we're still dealing with the corona, I want to say, it is during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I'm going to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. I would roughly estimate, I probably watched this movie overall between five and ten times, and I believe my first viewing was in 2001. It, it was on TV, so it wasn't the exact same time as it came out. So, yeah, I first watched this movie 20 years ago, and for many years I didn't have access to it. Now I have access to it again, that's why I'm doing the video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago, but, you know, the last time I had access to it was before I was doing videos. Actually, I think this might be one of the movies that I bought years ago, and just, it's been on the list. Anyway. So, the movie is set seven years after the events of the first one. The child has grown to 
10 years of age. Not sure how that happened. I mean, we know for a fact that he's not enhanced. But, of course, you can plainly see from looking at Christopher Lambert's face, he has definitely aged 7 years, not 10. It's not as though this movie is set in some kind of science fiction setting where you could hand wave away those three years less of aging or that it's really all that like it's it's just three years anyway like it would be one thing if if they said oh it's just the you know fortress one that happened yesterday you know and it would be easier to accept that he only aged seven years in ten years than that a ten year old kid that we're seeing in in this film is somehow only seven. And since I have no idea when the first movie was supposed to take place, what year, I don't know when this is supposed to take place either. You know, when I looked for when the first movie was set, I found, you know, depending on where you look, the first movie is set in 2012, 2017, 2023. IMDb trivia does say that this film, the sequel, takes place in 2027, which means the first one was set in 2020, which was one of the numbers I didn't see anywhere. John and the Rebels, you know, the, the, I don't even know how that, the Rebels were not mentioned at all, at all, in the first movie. I don't know where they came from, like, he says in this movie he doesn't want to work with the Rebels because he wants to protect his family instead. In the first movie, he must not have already been working with the Rebels since if, like, the the times where they talk about what, like, John is specifically in prison for impregnating his wife for a second time. If he was working with a group of Rebels that were going around blowing up power stations, I feel like that might have come up at least once in the first movie. So I guess we're to take it that he joined the Rebels sometime in the first 10 years of his son's life, but now he doesn't want to join. He doesn't want to rejoin them because he wants to protect his family. It's just, they wanted this Rebel thing in this movie and they just... And they wanted there to be a connection. They wanted it to not be that they just came by and talked to John about the Rebels for the first time. So we're just supposed to accept this ridiculous retcon. Just, if you wanted the whole thing with the Rebels, like, I hate to be, uh, this is going to sound really cynical, but after all, we are only talking about fictional characters here. Like, if his son had died between the first movie and this one, then it'd be like, okay, he's going to go mess some stuff up. He's going to go blow up some buildings to get revenge. But no, apparently he left his young child alone with his mother, even though all three of them were being hunted throughout America. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on because if I don't move on, we're going to be here all day. John and the Rebels are captured and sent to a more sophisticated fortress prison than the one in the first movie. This one... In space. In space. In space. It took me maybe 10 seconds to find the app to add an echo to a recording of my own voice. And I probably didn't spend much more than, I want to say, two minutes fiddling with effects and such to try to get it to the right effect. This movie does not deserve that much effort. You know how they say, in space, no one can hear you scream? I never realized that that's actually a direct result of some movies about space being so terrible that you scream so loud and for so long that... First your ears bleed, and then they pop, and suddenly the movie doesn't sound as bad anymore. Now, does it make sense that they could build a space station in seven years? I mean, I guess it's possible that they were in the process of building it before the events of the first movie. But if they were, then why weren't they sending prisoners up there to 
build it bigger, which is what ha you know, in this movie, the prisoners are explicitly used as labor to build the space station bigger. So, yeah, it's... Uh, now, I'm going to try to highlight the positives of this movie, because there are some positives to be found. And I do not like doing videos anymore where I only talk about negatives. Quoting a fellow critic here, All too often, setting a sequel in space means the beginning of a severe downward spiral for the franchise. Sometimes it comes around later, Friday the 13th, 10, Jason X, rather than sooner, Hellraiser 4, Bloodlines, or Leprechaun 4 in space. But it's rare that it should come around on the second installment, but that's precisely where Fortress 2 went. No shit, space. Just skip to the end. Before someone accuses me of just loving the first movie from nostalgia and not remembering its actual quality or lack of thereof, in addition to watching the first movie, you know, rewatching it on the 21st of August to do a video on it, I also rewatched it, let's see, two, three days ago, so that it would be fresh in my mind and I could properly compare the two movies, in addition to many, many viewings years ago. And I, again, really hugely got into it and, yeah, tremendously enjoyed watching it again. Now, we again do get some exploration of how society handles prisoners. But yeah, so this is the part of my notes where I get into, do I think it's been done better before? Yeah, the first one. Was this movie worth making? Not especially, no. So, the... <laughs> the IMDb more like this list compares this to The First, Fo the first Fortress, 8 out of 10. Beowulf, 1999, 7 out of 10. It has the same star, but it's a lot ed edgier than this movie. And Resurrection, which... I gave it a 6 out of 10, and also has the same star. I, yeah. There's not that many... Yeah, I don't, I don't know why this one wasn't compared to... I want to say it was called No Escape, like the first one was, but anyway, moving on. I, I don't hate the pun in the title. I know, some people, no tolerance for puns. They called the sequel Re-Entry because it's space and, you know, re-entry and because he's entering a fortress prison again. So, entry. It's... I've heard worse puns. I've liked worse puns. I decided to review this movie because I think it's worth exploring how much better the first one is and how easily the first one could have been as bad as this movie is. The original, the first viewing of, of this movie, I was hoping it would be at least remotely as good as the first. So the this fits into the subgenre of prison drama and the other stuff I've watched from there, stuff that I love, Fortress 1, The Shawshank Redemption, and Prison Break. Now... The movie goes through way too many of the same, like, plot. <sighs> Both of them have, like, a fairly meaningless fight between, like, you know, it's a prison, fights break out. And, and yeah. The, the, and the way they gradually, you know, John and, and his fellow convicts gradually find some things that could maybe help them escape is also obviously that's an overall aspect that we want to see again that's you know why would you make a sequel to you know a 
popular movie if you're not going to try to deliver something of the of the same so yeah not a huge surprise that it's there but it's just frustrating that it feels so yeah it's just it's not that it's not as compelling as the first and it just doesn't feel like it's it's it feels too repetitive and predictable now let's see yeah so quoting a fellow critic here as for the plot it was far too unbelievable and dare i say it actually quite boring so some spoilers for the movie Fortress 2 seems to plod along. The characters seem to muck around within the prison for a long while before we see any movement towards escape. When he finally does escape, and if you consider knowing that he does escape as a spoiler, then you are naive since it is obvious that the end product of the movie will be the character escaping. It all seems so easy and not really that difficult to do at all, unlike the first film where a lot of the movie time was spent planning the escape. He pulls off amazing computer-related feats as well as succeeding in kicking as many butts as, butts as possible, all within about 20 minutes. No more spoilers for the time being. It's a shame that this isn't better. In the movie's defense, they do try to they do try some interesting things. The problem is that there just isn't enough of this. It's mostly fortress again. On top of that, the simple straightforward plotting has been re replaced with lots of ancillary stuff that goes nowhere. Yeah, and examples include the film's lone female prisoner of note has a thing for Lambert. One guard is helped out by Lambert befriends him. The few good and unique ideas really do stand in the shadows of the rehashed ones. Now, let's see. You get mostly the same film, silly retcons. The new warden was the original prison designer, apparently and new characters that come out of nowhere. Remember the military resistance group trying to stop Mentel? No, they were never mentioned before and just suddenly appear for this story. And... It's of course disappointing that the intestinator is no longer de rigueur. Now, the writing was done by Steven Feinberg, who wrote the characters and story, and also wrote for the first movie, Troy Neighbors, who also wrote characters and story, and also wrote for the first movie. John Flock wrote the screenplay. It's the only theatrical feature he's written. He's usually a producer, producing 14 films, including this and the first one. And Peter Doyle, who, wrote, who also wrote the screenplay, it's the only thing he's written, period, says IMDb. So, at least it's not only new people who had nothing to do with the first one. The script is a re weak rehash of the first, with a few added subplots, none of which being particularly good. Most of them are just there to keep the film going, or put in an action scene in order to distract the audience from the poor writing. And quoting fellow critic, things just happen in this movie. There's really no effort by the script or director to give us any characterization. We're stuck with Brennig is in prison. Now he must bust out as soon as the movie starts. There's plot holes galore, stupid scenes, and some terrible special effects.
they make him do menial tasks like donning a spacesuit and fixing things outside the ship. I thought people needed special training to work in space. What are we spending all that money on astronauts for? Indeed. The movie handles plot twists fairly badly. It's not that there are too many or too few, but they're pretty bad. They're, they're also largely not too easy to figure out for the viewer. But just, yeah, it's like several of the, the major plot twists you're barely going to believe as you see, like... If I hadn't watched the movie, if someone described the movie to me, I don't think I would believe when, when they describe the plot twists. So this was directed by Jeff Murphy, R.I.P. This is the only thing I've seen that he's directed, but the... Yeah, he's, he's known for directing Under Siege 2, Free Jack, and Young Guns 2. Which, if I recall, were fairly well received by, you know, the, the fans of Young Guns 1 and Under Siege 1. And, yeah, like, I was, I was very surprised that this guy had directed action before, because based on this movie, he doesn't seem to be that good at it. But according to IMDb trivia, he enjoyed working with Christopher Lambert on the film, which is nice. He wanted to make the movie an exciting space saga. I mean, ambition is nice. Now. Yeah, so quoting fellow critics. The film at least rises to a level of routine competence. Alas, it is never anything more than that. Whereas the original director, Stuart Gordon of Reanimator fame, RIP, play things with his tongue firmly in cheek, Murphy films the far-fetched proceedings in a fairly straightforward manner as if this crap was actually plausible. I'm sure shooting inside a prison is hard. You don't have much leeway in terms of where to set up your shots and whatnot, so... From a visual standpoint, I can't give him too much flack. I'm sure his hands were tied to a degree. Still, Murphy is able to pull off some impressive shots here and there, so it's not a total loss. It just never really gets above average in the entertainment department, and Jeff Murphy being confined in such a tight, small setting is unable to make the film look interesting, which really goes a long way with films like this. Because even if it's not all that entertaining, if it at least packs a visual punch, then that that's something, but sadly, not even Murphy's oftentimes impressive camera work can add much value to this experience. So the movie opens with John out in the woods, and you know he's he's near his family. the The very opening has John preventing the Mentel people from catching his wife and son showing that he's still self-sacrificing and having an actual action scene before imprisonment of John that isn't just people running from dogs and people yeah people running from other people and dogs chasing them is a good idea you know i i don't think it's a problem with fortress one that it doesn't have like any big action before we get to the prison but i do think it was a good idea for this movie to have you know, to, yeah, to, to have something different, something that we didn't see in the first movie. Also because, like, the, the fact that this movie exists, you know, if you watch the first movie, you see how hard won the victory was. You, you see them escape, you see them barely survive, you know. The, the movie literally ends with, it looking like Karen, John's wife, and their newborn died in a massive explosion. And then John realizes they, they managed to get out of the barn that blew up before it blew up. It's such a relief. It's such a hard-won victory. 
there shouldn't be a sequel. And I'm not going to criticize, I'm, I'm not going to go hard on this movie just because it's a sequel that shouldn't really exist. Because it does. So I'm just going to, I'm going to criticize it for what it actually has. But if you're going to put him back in prison, yeah, you, you have to at least have something like, it would be so just soul crushing if this movie just opened with him getting caught and being put back, you know, but they actually, he, you know, he had an escape plan. I'm not going to give away how that works out, but he had an escape plan. He like hid weapons near the, the cabin that they live in. So, you know, the, the, it occurred to them that maybe they would eventually have to get away from, from Mentel. Didn't they cross the, they crossed the border at the end of the first movie. Why are they still dealing with American authorities if they're no longer in America? I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Or we're going to be here all day. Quoting a fellow critic, after a prologue set in a gorgeous wilderness lodge in the Rockies, Fortress 2 sees Brennick, seven years after the events of the first film, with his ragtag group of rebels enduring in their continuing assault on Mentel. They're recaptured and sent to a more inescapable prison with a more ruthless warden, where they plan a more outrageous escape. In space. Daft? Yes. Ropey? You betcha. Let's see. Is it good though? No, not even close. I don't like criticizing credit sequences because for a number of movies they just don't really put in a lot of effort. It's it's kind of the that's kind of the place where you can just kind of half ass it. But these are the kind of awkward opening credits where the text is on black screen. So every like I don't know, maybe once a minute or something, it will cut from the actual opening of the movie to just a black screen with text on it, and then back again, and, you know, it breaks up the action of the first scene, and it's just, like, I think there was a reason for them to put it on black screen instead of over the, the actual image. I don't offhand know what it is, but... I can imagine it's a great reason, but it really does, it really is frustrating that that's how it opens. So, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. It fits with what came before. The ending is fine. It's, you know, the movie has bigger problems. There's not really deus ex machina. There is some convenient writing. Now. Quoting fellow critics here, just before we hit the third act, the film runs out of steam. The incessant chase becomes redundant and the effects aren't up to par. The third act itself has terrible character blocking and is highly unlikely. But Lambert is stuck in space and he needs to escape by the time the credits roll. Will he succeed? The only way to know is to watch it. Prepare for the best, but expect the worst. Now, this is one of the movies I wrote in my... In the in the draft for for the notes for these, does the movie lose your interest along the way? For almost all the movies I've done videos on since I started doing that, the answer was no. This movie is one of this is one of the movies that are the reason for me doing that. The movie actually loses your interest pretty early on like you really there's just such a lack 
of a sense of purpose, a lack of tension. Yeah. I wouldn't really say... Mo most of the film is just fairly average. There's not really, like... Some, some movies that are average have, like, one or two scenes that you can point to that are, like, okay, that's cool. You know, like, I, I know people who can't sit through the entirety of Species 2, but they're still, like, okay, that one or two scenes, they're worth watching at least once, showing to a friend at least once. There isn't, isn't really anything like that in this movie. No, you know, the, the movie, it's not worth suffering through the, the, the bad parts to get to the good part. There, there aren't really any especially good parts. So the movie, as a sequel, the edge is gone. And to some extent, even the fact that there is a sequel takes away from the first one. He spends the entire first movie getting out of prison and then gets caught really early in the sequel. I mean, okay, the character had seven years or ten years to, you know, experience other things. But for for us, the viewer, you know, we we didn't see any of that. We only and, and don't get me wrong, I get it. I'm not saying that people would have stuck around for I mean they did apparently think someone thought that there was a TV show in after the events of the first movie, John, Karen, and their son on the run. I mean I guess maybe, but I don't Yeah. As I said in the in my review for the first one, you know, I, I we're probably never going to get Fortress 3. This movie did abysmal, but if they were ever going to make another Fortress, if they're going to make a spir spiritual successor, I think a mix of Fortress and Fortress 1, not 2, Fortress 1 and Prison Break, I think that could be fun. I think that might work. There might be at least a few seasons in, some, in something like that. Now, according to Wikipedia, a, yeah, one critic said, the film lacks Fortress director Stuart Gordon's wit and grit, though director Jeff Murphy makes it a decent enough ride. Another critic said, at best, a pale imitation of the original Fortress on its own, it's a passable movie with an adequate budget, both for sets and CGI space effects. Too bad it had to be a sequel to a superior movie instead of something wholly its own. Now, yeah, so characters, several of the characters are really just archetypes. You know, you don't find out very much about the characters. They just, they have a few defining traits. So, if, you know, if you can't get into characters and that are that way, that probably is going to be true for, for this movie. Now, the movie does conjure up some empathy for, for John. I would say that you do feel some I wouldn't go so far as say hatred, but some like reasonable dislike towards some of the antagonists. I would say not not Teller himself, the the warden especially. I I've never really cared much about him on any of my viewings, but Sato, the sadistic guard, is a decent like you know, he has some I suppose he's not more well-defined than Teller, but he's more intense and intimidating than Teller. So, talking about Christopher Lambert as Brennick, John H. Brennick. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to start by quoting fellow critics here. 
One thing that kept the first film quite interesting is that it had a double plot of what was happening to John and what was happening to Karen. Here it's all about John. Karen gets left on Earth, which gives Lambert a lot of heavy lifting to do that he clearly struggles with. Had Mr. Brennick gone the way of Miss Brennick and had been and been recast for re-entry, this follow-up would have went from bad to just downright intolerable. But luckily, thanks to Lambert, we get to pass the time in a sort of comfort, given his history with the Hem character and the depths his career sunk to at one point. It wouldn't be a surprise if his agent put in a call and said, don't worry, Christopher, if all goes wrong, there's always Fortress 3. Whether or not that's a good thing will remain a mystery, for now at least. Christopher Lambert does his shtick. He's having a good time, murderously, mis mysteriously whispering his way through this movie like he's got it all figured out. And yes, John is still being charged with the crime of having conceived more than one child. I'm not the first person to point out how absurd the idea of America having a one-child policy is. There's an extreme amount of unused space in America. Not, we're not going to run out of room. Realize that. Like, you realize that if we threw every single human being currently living on the planet into the Grand Canyon, a substantial amount of them would die on impact. That was a joke. Sometimes people don't get it when I... An expectation subversion, if you will. Now, Beth Toussaint as Karen B. Brennick, quoting fellow critic, the implied threat to Karen Brennick and her son, who is now about 10 years old, as opposed to a developing embryo, as was the case in the original film, is nowhere near as pernicious this time around. Sadly, this threat was one thing that made the original Fortress as entertaining as it was. This is definitely a rental-only film. Like, for how little the they are in the movie, again... Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as to say that, you know, they might as well have killed off the character. But, just, it, the... For one thing, the fact that they aren't captured immediately like they were in the first. There's just this immediate sense that they aren't in as much danger. And at that point, like... Yeah, that, that was one of the, the really important parts of the first one. The, the fact that... In addition to getting out, you know, obviously we want him to be safe, but he actually, like, in the first movie, one of the first things he says is he's fine that he's serving 31 years for conceiving a second, for, wait, impregnating his wife a second time because his wife is safe with their baby, with, with the embryo. So the, the, you know, he's not escaping, in the first movie, he's not escaping because he wants his own freedom. He's escaping because he wants his wife and their son to be free. And, you know, don't get me wrong, like, in this one, he's escaping so he can be with his family. That's, there's still some, you know, but the fact that they're, like... If you rewrote this movie to not be a sequel to the first one, it would be extreme, like, it would actually make more sense. Like, all the things I've mentioned that make it make less sense, like building a space station in seven years, the, the kid aging, you know, to ten years in seven years, the, the suddenly, you know, them, them suddenly talking about the rebellion which there, there was no mention of it in the first one and would have made so much sense to mention it. If this wasn't a sequel, but a spiritual successor, you know, instead of Fortress, it's, I don't know, Fort. And, you know, they just name his character something else and honestly write out his family. Because suddenly it does make sense that he, 
you know, he used to work with the Rebellion, and then, like, maybe the reason they're coming to try to talk him into being part of the Rebellion again, like, maybe they started planning missions that he thought were too dangerous. And so they make an appeal to him saying, you know, maybe it's dangerous, but it is also necessary. Just, just like that, you know, the movie's, the movie makes a lot more sense. The movie is a lot better. And, yeah. But I get why they put it in space. It really, like, you know, the first one was deep under the Earth's surface. You know, so, so just putting them in, like, Rikers, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to be enough for people to, you know, like... Most of the people who watched this movie, you know, they they heard about it, they saw the cover or something, they didn't watch it in theaters, they were going through Blockbuster or something, and they saw the cover, and they were like, I mean, I Fortress was a good movie, but we don't really need a sequel, and then they're going to look at it, and they're going to be like, oh, it's in space, okay, that sounds kind of cool, and then they rent it, so, yeah. At one point, the warden of this movie, Teller, says that he was also the warden of Fortress, you know, yeah, f f the Fortress in the first. I have to admit, I'm very impressed by how good of a job they did putting him back together after he was blown up. I mean, not a scar on him. My compliments to your surgeons. I mean, he was he was goo on the floor the last time we saw... Again, why two of the writers for this were, you know, helped write the first movie? How did, how did that slip past? So, like the prison in the first one, the prison in this movie is owned by the Mentel Corporation, and the guy who runs... This prison is called Teller. So, Teller of Mantel tells men. Mantel owns men that Teller of Mantel is telling this to. Now, let's see. Yeah, so. The the cast of characters from the first are pretty much, you know, other than Lambert, they, they just bring in new people to serve the same roles, meaning that the new cast pretty much just fills the shoes of the characters from the first. And, yeah, you know, the... The first movie's hacker was a neurotic, nervous guy, beautifully portrayed by the great horror talent Jeffrey Combs, is replaced by an annoying black guy stereotype. And just, you know, the if, if you've watched... If you've watched Not Another Teen Movie, first of all, why? Second of all, you might remember... There is a character who, you know, says that he is the black guy stereotype in a teen movie. So he's just supposed to be there and occasionally say, damn, that's whack, and that kind of thing. That's basically what they're doing here. You know, he, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and the 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 warden, you know, Kurtwood Smith added a lot of depth to a character that could easily have been one note. And part of it is also the writing, to be fair. 
in in the first movie, but in this one, he's just kind of annoying and like they make him kind of effeminate. I think that might have been it might be the actor who made the choice to make him effeminate. Maybe maybe he thought it would make him more memorable or something. And just yeah. He's he just really gets on your nerves when Smith was this menacing and threatening presence. So, quoting fellow critics here, Patrick Malahide provides a few laughs as a slightly camp governor. It is not enough to save a film that sorely lacks energy. Now. Rick Patrick Malahide is a bit subdued as the main bad guy. The trouble is, Kurt Wood Smith did, did this stuff really well in the last film, and Malahide doesn't have a chance to come close. Pam Greer has an extremely weird extended cameo and seems totally out of place. Nick Brimble, Frankenstein Unbound's monster, is a fellow convict. That's where I've seen him before. Yeah. Yeah. I've watched. Now, now I can't even remember the, the producer director's name. The, the, yeah, director of Frankenstein Unbound. I've watched more than one movie directed by him. Yeah, it's, it was a mistake. So Patrick Malahide calculating that the only way to salvage his professional reputation is not to be caught taking this part seriously, Malahide delivers a performance of pure pantodam proportions, cue over-the-top line readings and theatrical eye-rolling, shameless hamming it may be, but it does provide what little entertainment there is to be gleaned here. Veteran actress Pam Greer looks embarrassed to be here, which is understandable. Malahide comes across as an accountant where Kurtwood Smith Smith was sinister. Now the dialogue. The IMDb quote section only has three quotes. Like, there are movies that are also less than 90 minutes that have substantially more than only three. And all three of them are bad. You know, it's it's called the IMDb memorable quotes. It doesn't, it, it's not called the great quote, you know, the memorable can have a negative connotation as well. The dialogue is pretty bad, with one or two exceptions. It might sound like a minor issue, but while both movies were filmed in Australia and include some local talent, the first one, everyone has an American accent, where in this movie, several people have distinct Australian accents, when the story is supposed to be explicitly about America and Americans. And that includes the, the, the new voice for Z10, like, there's a very clear Australian accent there, and it's just, I know, I know, I realize how this sounds. I realize that it's ridiculous to claim that a neutral American accent just sounds like normal or natural or whatever, and an Australian one sounds different and has to be justified. 
but that is the environment in which this movie was produced. You know, it's it's not it's not that the movie is like trying to be more diverse, although I guess that might be you know, the movie does have a black guy as a hacker when a lot of people think of black men as less intelligent. This movie is, you know, trying to say, well, here's a hacker, here's a black man who's so smart, so good with computers that he's a professional hacker, you know. And Pam Greer, who actually works for Mentel, so, you know, she has a position of great power you know, so, but the fact that some of the actors clearly have Australian accents, that's, it's not so that the movie is more, like, has more diversity. Having more diversity is great, but it's supposed to be commenting on America specifically and only, and it, it is, like, you end up wondering, wait, did... I mean, they they were caught in America, right? Because otherwise, why would they be in an American prison and just, yeah, it it's, anyway. We do see John Brennick in varied circumstances. You know, we see what he's like when things go, are going well, how he responds to things going wrong. You know, it's still not a really deeply characterized character, but there is some, you know, personality there. So the, the cinematography was handled by Hiro Narita, who was also the director of photography on various other things, but these are the three that I actually watched. Hocus Pocus, Star Trek Six: The Undiscovered Country, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. The... Yeah, the cinematography has some good, you know... Yeah, there's there's definitely... You know, one of, one of my fellow critics, call, you know, says the movie has atmospheric cinematography. And, yeah, for for sure there is some... I, th I think it may be, maybe especially when you see space, like, you know, I already mentioned that there's at least one scene of convicts, like, fixing up some of the space station from the outside. Yeah, some of that is legitimately, like, you know, we've seen it so many times. So maybe sometimes we can forget. It does take some skill and method to make, you know, like, we the viewer, we know we're not seeing space. You have to, you have to really get it right for us to even temporarily be like, oh, I think this does kind of look like space. Because if we clock, if, if we're like, that doesn't look like space, then immediately we're out of the scene. And they do a pretty decent job. Yeah, it does look like space. Which, especially considering for 2000, is very impressive. You know, today, of course, today, if you have a, a big budget, you can make something look like outer space. But yeah. Moving on to the editing, which was handled by James R. Simons, who edited... Naked Gun 2 and 3, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 and 3, and Rambo 3. Some of the editing of, of some of those movies is legitimately pretty good. I'm going to once again quote, quote one of my fellow critics here. The editing is choppy. And, yeah. I mean, some of the editing... The problem is they don't have good footage, and that's not really the fault of the cinematographer or even really the director. It's just, yeah, it's difficult to film. <sighs> yeah. But the first movie has really great cinematography. 
and you know a a much more compelling looking set so yeah so the the special effects bad effects are a problem when your main setting is in space and yeah there are several shots of like space shuttles and like like again when they just they have a physical set for when they're just trying to like fix the outside of the of the hull of the space station the it looks sufficiently convincing you know but the moment that they actually have to show yeah the moment something in space has to be moving it has to be animated you know th this was not a movie that was made when model work was used a lot for outer space stuff and yeah it's it's a problem i i don't think there's a single shot of cgi that is actually convincing i i pretty much say you can always tell when there's cgi in this movie and yeah it's a problem now let's see yeah so quoting fellow critics there's some really horrible cheap CGI for the shots outside of the space station that look like they're from a budget release video game. Normally I'm okay if cheap CGI is integrated with live action, but these shots are so jarring they really take you out of the film. The special effects are above average for a movie with a reported budget of only 10 million. The, the stunts are, are pretty decent. Yeah, supposedly this was made off $11 million budget. Quoting fellow critics here, There's less money all around, which means the effects are worse and the film has an emptier feel to it as a whole. With a supposed budget of about $12 million, I can't really see where the money went if that figure is true. Filmed in Luxembourg. Oh, right, Luxembourg. Yeah. I think I said Australia. N yeah. Consider that a correction. The production values look cheap. Instead of having a reasonable budget, like on the first film, it looks like they spent all of $47 on this one. Yeah, the production design, it's somewhat cheap looking. And, yeah, on, on sets, again, quoting fellow critic, I think part of the problem with the sequel was the fact that the original prison was this enormous underground labyrinth, whereas the space station is just that, a space station. There's nothing particularly memorable about its setup. I'm a big fan of directors who can do cinematic geography well. i be able to show the viewer in clear detail how location is structured or where a car chase is taking place. It actually takes a lot of skill to do, and I think Gordon pulled it off really well in the original, but the sequel is just an endless parade of anonymous hallways and rooms. Not much planning went into set design. There were very little of the fancy modern gadget of, gadgets of the first movie, and you can tell they were cutting costs. Much of the film was computer generated to cover the missing pieces. And costume wise, you know, it's it's okay. It's, it's like, again, it is a sequel. The first movie has these really cool, you know, the strike clones are in intensely memorable. And there's nothing that looks even remotely as cool as that in this movie. Now, the action can be fairly tense and suspenseful at its very best. Now, the action is mostly just rehashes of the first, just made a little less exciting. 
Remember those way cool machine guns with three barrels in the first? They're replaced with dull, futuristic looking stick stun guns. One of the guards in this movie likes to watch Khans fight and either wait for one to win or he gets involved himself. Other than being a cliche of prison dramas, it also feels like a step down from the first one where the lack of humanity displayed by guards is satirized by having there basically not be in guards. It's just Z10 and her patrolling cameras. Now, let's see. So, yeah, according to the critics, it's a film that sorely lacks energy and various moments of action are ruined by poor camera angles and clumsy editing. The action scenes are run of the mill and the special effects are okay. And the show at least amounts a passable action climax. But the scripters have not endeavored to approach this film in any more intelligent a way than they did the original. Also, the escape method is far less ingenious this time around. However, there is one superb bit of silliness that briefly brings to mind the original's tone. And... Yeah, okay, so... Spoiler, in which Lambert gets thrown out of an airlock into space without a suit and manages to hold his breath for a few seconds and get to another airlock and let himself back inside. If only the film had more crazy physics-defying bits like this, I might have enjoyed it more. Yeah, depending on who you ask, that bit is, you know, fun because it's nonsense or just frustrating because it's nonsense I thought it was like it's just it's too nonsensical for me for it to be particularly fun to watch no more spoilers for the time being the action scenes are very flat and unimpressive they have no pace or excitement and apart from one or two half decent punch ups Fortress just doesn't deliver on the action to its credit, Reentry has some passable action scenes. I like being a scene where Lambert takes on a flamethrower wielding prisoner while armed with a makeshift weapon and shield. The climax is more spectacular. La the Lambert fights a prisoner bit takes place later, and they actually up the ante by having it be against Dog Welder. And I quite appreciate that John is seen using guerrilla tactics even at the start of the movie, and the bit of him being captured features multiple helicopters, a jeep, guns, you know, these are obviously bigger than the first one where, again, it was guard dogs and running on foot. Still not saying that it's better than the first one, but it needed to be something different from the first one. And, and it's also, in the first one, they get caught while trying to cross the border. I really appreciate that they don't just do that again. In this one, they are caught while trying to hide in one place. That, again, you know, it's there's only so many times we can watch the same scene. You know, the first movie has two scenes of, of John and Karen crossing the border. And it's, there's actually, you know, it's it's this slightly clever thing of, at the start, they're trying to cross it into Canada. And presumably that was closer, because as we see at the end of the film, the border into Mexico is much, much easier to cross into. But, you know, they they did think that they could cross into Canada without being caught. But yeah, you know, by the end of the second movie, we've seen these people trying to cross the border t twice and in the second you know the second time they do manage to cross this movie does not open with a third attempt at crossing a border that would just be like come on people seriously and the fact that there are these helicopters you know there one of the helicopters has like i want to say it's an m60 machine gun you know and they're flying they're trying to shoot john that makes sense as this thing of, like, they've been sent out by people who are desperate to 
capture or kill John. You know, it would make less sense if something like that was at a border crossing in the first movie. The start of the movie has John and his son engage in a horse race, which has no stakes, but, I mean, I guess it adds an action beat? Lame. But yeah, the, the action scene types include chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. So, you know, that is, it is, they have some cool stuff there. I want to briefly acknowledge, I think, I think the reason that they aren't firing, like, yeah, I already mentioned that the first one, you know, in case it's been a while since you watched it, or if you haven't watched it at all, and you're watching this review, the first one, there are multiple machine guns that are like, you know, yeah, these triple barrel machine guns that the strike clones come with, and John grabs one and fires at, you know, various, various enemies. I think the reason why they don't have, you know, yeah, why the guards in this are carrying stun, yeah, what did I call them again? Stun guns, S sticks, yeah. The fact that they are on a space station means that you don't want to be firing, like, high, like, you know, really powerful caliber guns off just all over the place obviously i get that but it's still a downgrade now and actually like the the oh actually one more the, there's also a little bit of actual martial arts in in action scenes anyway the the like you know several of so, some of the time the yeah the the stun guns just weren't particularly impressive like again i get it you don't want a gun on a space station and, you know, stun guns are effective in real life, but they're just so much less visually impactful than triple barrel machine guns and, and flamethrowers. Now, let's see, do the, the antagonist plan make sense? Mm, meh. Should it? Yes. Do the hero's plan, does the hero's plan make sense? Eh, not it's, it's 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 okay I guess, and it definitely should make a lot of sense. Now, the scenes are easy to follow; they're meant to, and I agree with that decision. Now, the music was handled by Christopher Frankie, who scored Green Street Hooligans, Universal Soldier, and McBain. I don't remember much of McBain, but those, Green Street, yeah, the other two movies have great score, and there's some, some of the music is quite good in this, some of it's very suspenseful and tense. There's some good stuff in the sound design, like, they again have an implant that causes pain to punish people, which also, like, now that they also have guards with stun guns, it's like, doesn't, you know, do you really need both an implant that causes pain and guards with stun guns? Like, again, like, it seems like they don't realize part of the point of the first one was the American prison system is inhumane in how it treats prisoners. You might as well not have guards, but just an AI with cameras that, you know, spies in on you, and if you, if, if it sees something it doesn't like, it causes pain. 
But then in this one, they just have both. It's just, yeah. But the implant causes pain and it gives off a noise because otherwise it's just an actor, you know, yeah, one actor saying, you know, uh, crap, I forget. Yes, they don't call it intestinate anymore. Let's just go with discipline or something. And then an actor going, like, ah, you know, oh, it hurts. If if there isn't also an an you know an audible yeah then it it doesn't feel like something's really happening there because we're not really seeing it obviously it's an implant I mean I guess if the movie went with like an X-ray shot for some but that would be ridiculous now there's some black comedy some blue comedy. So, on tone, quoting fellow critics here, a few campy thrills, but the first one's a whole lot better. Two out of five. And the CGI and space, the CGI space effects are pretty cheesy, but then that's the film's tone as a whole. Spoiler. You can't watch Lambert battle a guy with a flamethrower or get injected into space only to fly back into the airlock and expect to take it seriously. Brennick gets thrown out into space but holds his breath for 30 seconds, opens another airlock from outside, and climbs back in. Let me repeat that last one slowly. Man holds breath in vacuum of space. Holds his breath. At this point I realize that the writers think I'm dumb. I have never seen a man in space, but surely the vacuum effect would suck every bit of air from you in a second, regardless of how good you were at swimming at school. I know the plot is never going to be totally realistic, being set in, an, in a space-based prison and all, but I expect films to at least try to be realistic within their own settings. This just smacks of laziness to me. No more spoilers for the time being. I mean, the, yeah. Realism is not a high priority here. You definitely need to suspend disbelief to enjoy this one. The laws of physics somewhat apply. Now, the pacing isn't particularly good. Quoting fellow critics here, the first movie was a serious psychological dystopia on the topic of dehumanization, in particular of an inmate and in general of the society. Unfortunately, after the first half had this very noticeable transition, ending with a... Okay, never mind. Let's see. And with the sequel, they took a drastically different approach. The music is even worse and does not evoke any feelings in conjunction with the on-screen events. Also, the dystopic ingredient is somewhere in the back, while the action is more in the front. But aside from the opening scene, the rest is coherent, unlike in the first picture of this duology. And... Yeah. The movie is an hour 25 and a half minutes long without end credits, an hour and 29 minutes long with them. It is not worth that investment of time. And, like... I mean, usually I say if you're not interested 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I suppose if you, if you like, yeah, if you like the opening where John fights off mentel people using guerrilla tactics, you know, if you if you can suffer through more of the movie, you know, there is some more guerrilla tactics in the movie, but that's yeah. The movie feels at least half an hour longer than it is. It's not really the kind of movie where like there are scenes you can just fast forward. No, no. If you start fast forwarding through, I don't. I don't think there's a single scene in this that doesn't progress the plot. I, th I think every single scene progresses the plot, at least somewhat. It's not 
the kind where you want to watch just certain parts but not others. I'm glad it's not longer. I wish it felt shorter. It, it is the right length. Like, it, if it was much shorter, then it would just be ridiculous. Although, I could point to a couple of things that, with a quick rewrite, you could get rid of. Now. There are a couple of progressive values expressed in this, which... I mean, I suppose the moment that you start talking prison reform, like, yeah, I, I don't think that's as much of a priority for conservatives as it is for progressives. I racked my brain trying to think of something to say, something to point to for this movie and say, you know what, that's actually, that's, that's, you know, yeah, what is the best element of this? Because for there to be a best, there has to be at least one that's good. Some of the escape is reasonably engaging, and it is legitimately, like, I like watching Christopher Lambert use guerrilla methods to overcome odds that, yeah, you know, so, you know, I like it in this, in The First Fortress, and in his Beowulf movie. Now, the worst aspect is the blandness and the lack of edge, and it will be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that, lower your expectations, and I think it is a big problem for the movie. Worst aspect, according to others, is the cheap look and feel. And again, you know, if you go into the movie knowing that, lowering your expectations, it will be less of a problem. But yeah, I do think it's a big problem for the movie. So before my first viewing, the thing I was most worried about was that it would just be a retread of the first with very few, if any, new ideas or new takes on old ideas. And sadly, the movie lived down to my expectations. You know, this is one of those sequels that mean that sequels overall have a bad name. The thing I was most looking forward to for the movie was taking it taking advantage of being in space instead of below the surface of the earth in the desert. And the movie failed to live up to my expectations. And, yeah, the movie can be entertaining to watch. It's not really good as a whole. Arguably, that it has a few good parts. It leaves unanswered questions, which is a problem for the movie. Let's see, the, the I only found one trailer. It gives away at least a little bit too much. Uh, you know, I've, I've online I found one that was a minute 29. I found one that was a minute 32. They're the same, just with like logos as a difference. Like the... It is one of those things where the trailer gives you a good idea of what the movie is like. You know, the... the yeah. If, if you like the trailer, you're... You're likely to like the movie as well. The cover and poster... Posters do not give away too much. And... I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't really say that, you know, if you like the, the cover or poster, you'll like the movie. It doesn't give it, give you a strong enough idea, I would say. There's just not much to latch on to. Yeah, the, the, 
if, if for one thing the cover makes the the movie look much edgier and darker than it is the movie does not have a lot of metaphors difficult to understand elements there's not a lot of depth stuff to analyze you don't need to watch it more than once For some of these, I make a list of suggestions for how to fix the movie, or at least greatly improve it. And, you know, honestly, I'm just, you know, what it needed was more, more originality, edge, and higher production values. And I realize that, you know, higher production values... I get that they were working on a budget, but so was the first one, and it looks better, it feels bigger than this one. It feels bigger. Several of the action scenes are substantially bigger in the first one than anything in this. And, like, let's see. I suppose movies were not as edgy in the year 2000 as in the year 1993. But it didn't need to be this dull of an edge. And I cannot, you you cannot convince me that they could not have mu mustered up more originality. I think they were afraid of, they they were, they were acting like we're, we're working with nitroglycerin here. We don't know why people like the first movie. Let's just, just do the same thing again, okay? Just do the same thing again. Maybe they'll like it, and we didn't especially. Now, let's when I searched on YouTube for videos about this movie, the only thing I found was a trailer. No, no videos talk like discussing the movie, which, yeah, I don't blame them. This has a zero percent on. Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, technically the tomato meter is not available, but it just felt good to say, you know, it only has like nine reviews. Yeah. The audience score is 21%, based on over 2,500 reviews. Ratings, rather. I'm not sure they all reviewed it. And yeah, that means. Tw only 21% rated it three and a half stars or higher. The movie's not featured on Metacritic at all. On IMDb, it only has 48 user reviews, 32 reviews via the title's IMDb external reviews section, and I was only able to copy in 21 of them. So, you know, some of them were dead links. It has 4.6 on IMDb out of 10, based on 6,824 IMDb user ratings. So, and yeah, the the 14 percent gave it a six. 22 and a half or 22.6 percent gave it five, and 20.1 percent gave it four. So. That's, yeah, not not a huge percentage of people thought that this was incredible on IMDb. The, yeah, on violence, quoting a fellow critic, the violence levels are really toned down. There's no exploding stomachs here. Instead, prisoners get headaches when they go out of bounds, which isn't as gory or scary. And, it, like... Again, if you want to be a sequel, you have to... It, it would be one thing if it was a remake, especially if it was a reboot, but it's a sequel. It's clearly appealing to, you know, it's trying to say, remember how cool this was in the first? Here's more. The first movie, one of the, like, very early on, you see the demonstration of the intestinator first you know, he gets intense pain in his stomach, and then it, you know, the intestinator blows up. We see his stomach expand and explode. 
a man dies from an explosion inside of his stomach like they don't they don't verbally spell it out but i'm going to have i'm i'm going to go ahead and guess that we're talking about like the explosion destroys or or at least like punctures in multiple places his vital organs that's a horrible way to die and then in this one oh you know headache like it's just i i legitimately don't see why they yeah and let's see the Yeah, there's a little bit of nudity. There's, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not gonna go into detail about it. It's not as compelling as the nudity in the first one. I think the. Yeah, the the violence, and yeah, not not really the the nudity. Although the fact that you know the first one featured, let's see, there was one real sex scene, and then there were like, yeah, I mean, two glimpses of almost sex. So arguably three sex scenes, and this one has some nudity. It's especially in the violence, more so, more than the nudity, that you see the lack of edge. And I'm not saying every movie has to be edgy, but if you're making a sequel to an edgy movie, like, people weren't watching, like, as far as I know, The First Fortress was rented, you know, yeah, a lot of people rented it. A, a good chunk of the people who went to Blockbuster who were looking for a movie like it, picked it up and rented it. They didn't rent it despite the violence and edge. They rented it in part because of it. So, yeah, no one's surprised that I'm not classifying this as capital C cinema, but junk food. And... Who do I recommend this movie to? If your desire to see a sequel to Fortress is stronger than your desire to avoid low quality movies, this one's for you. The, the DVD isn't especially like impressive, like there's a there's a trailer, but it's just, it's the, you know, one and a half minute one that's also online. So, you know, don't buy the DVD just for the trailer. It's already easily available. I, th I think it might be a higher quality than the one that's online, though. But, you know, and four minutes of featurette, and it's basically, it's, it's completely standard. It's not going to really tell you anything new. They're talking about how great the movie's going to be. And how great it's working with each other, and yeah, and brief talent profiles for Lambert, Lambert, and Greer. You know, if if you buy the DVD, it would basically only be so that you can rewatch the movie whenever you want. Now, depending on your country, let's see. Yeah, you can stream this movie on Tubi TV, iTunes, Amazon Video, Google Play. Right here on YouTube, Microsoft Store, Direct TV, and Vudu. That's, yeah, a lot of places do have it. So, yeah. Ultimately, this comes down to a rating of five bland remake by way of sequels out of ten. 
And that brings us to the first thought section disclaimers. So, spoilers throughout the rest of the video for this movie. I will still warn if I spoil something else. If you don't care about these disclaimers, try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, yeah, I've pretty much already said I don't really think... Yeah, I... I would... I would have less of a problem with this movie. Once again, I gave it a fair shake in the review. But I would have less of a problem with it if it wasn't a sequel, but like a spiritual success. Or like Christopher Lambert, you know, sometimes the same actor will play very similar roles in different movies. You know, I, I don't think that's a problem. Like, you know, the, the let's hypothetically say that Predator was actually a sequel to Commando you know, it's like, well, it's not made any better by being, like, no, that doesn't, no, that doesn't really work. I kind of wish that it wasn't a sequel, you know, just because both of them star Arnie and he plays, you know, yeah, they're Arnie movies, you know, so he plays the role in, you know, yeah, very similar ways, the two roles, and the, the world around him behaves in, you know, the way that it does in an Arnie movie. Yeah, I, I wish this was just a spiritual successor. Of course they're going to want to make more after the first one was so successful. But a direct sequel just isn't, yeah. So, let's see. The... The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts, some of its analysis, some of its MCK riff tracks, and other jokes. And, let's see. Yeah, the section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. I, there probably only will be these two thoughts sections, the, the disclaimers and then the notes taken while watching. So, let's see. The, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I would almost definitely say that would be Teller and Soda and no. I don't think the movie has empathy for them and ultimately I mean it's it's fine I don't think the movie would have been better if it had empathy for them even though the first movie was definitely made better by the fact that there clearly was some empathy for Poe Now, as much as a lot of the genres this movie falls into, it does tend to treat certain minorities badly, including women. So, let's see. The, are there misogynist tropes in this? I mean, I definitely do think it's really gross that, like, you and I, we know that a woman being overweight doesn't mean there's something wrong. You know, I've, I've always felt that, you know, only if you have, you know, if, if you, if your weight is so, 
so high or so low that it is an actual health risk for you that it could be dangerous if you don't change your weight then it you know I would say then please do if if you can change your weight but other other than that we should all feel comfortable in our own skin regardless of weight but when a movie films an overweight woman it very frequently uses overweight as visual shorthand you know as as a way of saying you shouldn't pay attention to this person and the fact that the the woman who you know i honestly i remember very little of what she said in in the the movie which i think really highlights how much of it is just white noise the one thing i do remember her saying she's it's it's she's the one who says that they sh she's basically encouraging them to masturbate encouraging the convicts to masturbate and one of the convicts gets so angry when he hears that that he headbutts a tv her i think the the movie is very much sending you know visually conveying to the audience you shouldn't be listening to her she's frustrating she's obnoxious you know because if the movie featured an attractive woman telling men to masturbate then that wouldn't you know that that would have a very different it would play differently and yeah just you know they they're trying to convey that she's not yeah and and it's just they didn't have to do that you know i get that if the role were played by a man then some of the people renting the movie would due to their homophobia probably tell other people not to rent it you know as though a man saying that masturbation is healthy is gay but you know certainly in 2000 a lot of people would have thought that other than that let's see other yeah so the the i don't even remember her character's name the female rebel she's sexualized you know it, she's technically not sexualized against her will because she did agree to it and she said you better make this worth it you know okay so now we're in this situation i you know she she was recorded showering for for an extended period of time and now they can you know yeah, they can they can basically spy on using the the homemade remote. It's not the only thing she contributes. I I do kind of wish that I I don't think it needed to be there, and it also just it's again like, okay, I get it. You know, they're saying that these men, you know male guards wouldn't think wouldn't wouldn't wonder why is one of the convicts just looking at this woman showering for a really long time you know they they won't change the channel and realize that something's you know and i do appreciate that at least you know the female guard also gets to you know there's that bit where she's like a male prisoner is showering and she's watching it intently and one of the male guards is like about you know he's moving his hand he's about to switch it and she you know she like grabs it and says don't you dare change channels you know something like that that was mildly amusing meanwhile they also have this like when when they're watching the the rebel woman showering then she at one point she's like does this make me look fat or something like that and it's just like i realized that 
the movie wasn't written by women. Not a single woman helped write the movie. At least, you know, not... Didn't... At least she didn't go credited, although... That would not really be a surprise if a woman didn't get credit for her hard work. So I realized that the movie wasn't written by women, but... Was it written by men who've never met women either? Because that's just like I'm not I'm not saying it has to be completely realistic, but that that writing it feels like yeah, it's just like it's it sounds like a a bad joke an incel would make or something. Just yeah. Anyway. But yeah, the the women are not only there for that and yeah, you know, she she helps out with with planning and the escape and such. You know, Pam Greer's character is made out to be kind of like a, you know, untrustworthy, easily swayed. But I suppose that is, you know, that's probably more of a criticizing corporate America thing than criticizing women or black women thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe some of both. Now, let's see the... That brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Just real quick before I get into the... Let's see. Yeah, the... the you know, one of the one of the critics pointed out that when you know this one guy takes his mask off, you know, Lambert is like, "You, I can't you believe you betrayed me," and the the critic was like, "Me and my girlfriend didn't even recognize him at first. I, I think I recognized him, but like, I didn't think it was a particularly good twist. At least, it didn't really, yeah." Let's see, was there any other that I wanted to, yeah, I think that's, but yeah, so we, you know, we have the opening with all the, the, the action and, you know, one of the helicopters is trying to find John and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to use infrared or something like that. I've got a lock on, and then it cuts to, to Lambert, and I'm just like, so does he. I'm not 100% certain why Christopher Lambert has a dramatic reaction, well, it's dramatic reaction as that man can muster up anyway, to the cabin being blown up. He knows for a fact that there was no one left in there. He was already captured at that point. It's not like he was going back there anytime soon. I guess maybe it was trying to imply that, oh, you know, he and his wife and kid made a life there. And it was like, well, put in, a, like, a brief flashback. I mean, they do that later. They they flash back to him and the kid, I want to say, was it the horse race, maybe? They flash back to that multiple times. I think at least twice in the movie. But nothing here, like, it... Because the cabin doesn't mean anything to the audience. We... We only, we've only knew, known it existed for about a minute by the time it's blown up. Okay, maybe five minutes by the time it's blown up, but yeah. I do appreciate the detail that the guard and the cons both clearly see Stanley's implantation fail, but the guard doesn't care even a little bit. Labors. Next, they'll want a fucking union. Huh. The villain hates unions. I mean, 
I've seen a lot of American movies that demonize unions, so it's nice to see one that's in favor of them. You know, that is the implication. The bad guy doesn't like a thing that means you should like it. That you should like it. There it is. I'm not saying this movie has to be the same as the first, but one of the sources of tension in the first was that the moment that John entered the, the you know, yeah, right when he got to his cell, the welcome was very hostile, but here it's a lot more neutral or even positive. Like the, I don't know, is, is it supposed to be that the black guy is being sarcastic or that just, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, it really, really doesn't work. A food fight, really? And we see that the behavior modification affects everyone except Stanley. Put a pin in that one. And we see the, you know, the friendly guard is in fact friendly. He's, you know, he thanks Brennick for helping him, which, you know, as the, the, as a reviewer pointed out, you know, all that leads to is that, you know, he dies in the climax for pathos, I guess. And the evil guard is clearly transphobic. Honestly, forgot how progressive some of the values of this movie are. You know, being against unions is evil. Being transphobic is evil. The rest of you go with Mr. Parker. Just be careful not to mention great power, great responsibility. It's a, it's a whole thing. Where are we going? Field trip and the fire flares up right behind him. Okay, some good stuff in this movie. And a sexist joke about women drivers, when in reality, statistics show it's just an incorrect idea spread by insecure men who couldn't handle the idea that women can do the same things they can. You know, if all you have is the the few things you can do as a man that women can't, then it must be terrifying when women start being able to do those things. But there are bigger problems than your ego. The meteor shower is decently tense, and the death of McDam is perfectly serviceable. You know, got all the little meteor things, and one goes, like, through the brain and out the other side. Why can convicts talk directly to pilots in this prison? Like, it makes no sense. Like taking candy from a baby. Just because you acknowledge your bad writing doesn't mean it's not still bad writing. In fact, it makes it worse because you just showed us you realize that the writing is bad. Do we have a problem? Oof, there's quite a long list. How much time you got? And John's escape attempt is foiled. And they were just standing there waiting to see him get recaptured. But the two guards that failed and allowed him to almost escape are fired. I knew I'd seen Gordon, the, the guard, somewhere. He played the marshal on Lost. So what did they want? International relations. Okay, that's not the worst line. It's just a bug. It's a bug in his food. That stuff is disgusting enough already. Even closing your eyes will not have you believe that it's tasty wheat. But who wrote that line? It's just a bug. He found a living cockroach in his food. I... Holy crap. Like... Wow. I... I am never going to dinner at the, the writer's house. I, I just, yeah, if, if you don't think a bug in the food is a big deal, yeah. Some of the flamethrower fight is cool. Now, the only thing I can figure for why the fight doesn't have Brennick defeat the guy, but instead he himself accidentally catches on fire, is that they didn't want John actually intentionally set someone on fire but you know but they did want it to end with him on fire 
but then he does kick the guy into the furnace right after, although I guess he'll die quicker down there than burning to death, maybe? And they realize that there are cameras inside their head. I do feel some respect towards the shot of infinite camera feeds in the same shot, you know, because he's looking at the, the, ah, what's it called? Yeah, he's, his, his eye has been made into a camera, and he's looking directly at the monitor, which is showing what he's looking at, so he just, it's, you know, monitor after monitor. And, and, I mean, they did, it's not a static shot either, you see him turn to look at the monitor, turn to look at black eye, turn to look at the monitor, you know, so it's like, yes, I, I don't remember anybody's name in this, because they're so, they're such unmemorable characters. I swear, it's not the fact that he's black, that, that's not why I don't remember his name. The... And, and it's also, it's a decent enough idea, you know, they, you know, in, in prison you basically don't have privacy, and yeah, the, the logical science fiction extreme of that is they can see everything you can see. But again, it does mean, you know, it does, yeah, it, it does mean that then we're like, then how are they going to ever be able to escape? Oh, because there's four minutes recording of a woman taking a shower. That's, yeah. That's an unusual choice of words. Yeah, it's almost like it's incredibly stupid writing. Marshall arrives. The, the shuttle arrives tomorrow. Tomorrow? That's only a day away. I remembered it as the implant having a camera, which is also stupid, I realize. I forgot it needed to tap into the optic nerve. Marcus, that's his name, tapped into the optic nerve of the cockroach. That's beyond ridiculous, but not quite so far behind, beyond it that it then circles back around to being awesome. It's just me, Zed. Suspend it. What, my disbelief? Not on your life. Seriously, they just happened to get lucky that Sato and the cockroach are in the same place at the exact same time. Meanwhile, it is obviously the fault of the director that Sato believes that Zed would make that mistake anyway since he did say that there were technical issues, which, if he had just been like, you know what, you're evil, I'm evil, you know, I'll, I'll let you in on, I, let's see, what was it, I think it was that the, there was no punishment for the prisoner attacking Gordon, I think it was, some, something like that. Is Pam Greer wearing the kind of cape that you would normally see royalty wear? One of us should go. He's the only one who can go past the pain section without having his brain fried. Oh, right. How did I forget such an utterly obvious fact? It's almost like this entire exchange exists for no other reason than to remind the audience of something they should already know. Like, there's not that much that you have to remember for this movie. Like, was that line thrown in there because of, like, an early screening and someone with ADD couldn't... Yeah. I'm not trying to insult people with ADD. I got ADD. I'm using it neutrally, descript as descriptive. If I had to guess, I would say that the multiple failed attempts at escaping exist to add action to the movie without the plot progressing, since they needed the plot to take up, you know, almost 90 minutes. I just wish they weren't so obvious. One of them happens less than a third of the way into the movie. Of course, the protagonist isn't going to escape that early. 
And then the second one is about an hour into what is, you know, an 85 minute movie. Obviously, this ain't it, Chief. And, you know, Rennick getting from one of the exterior doors to another without a spacesuit is ridiculous. So I appreciate that at least he has to, you know, once once he gets inside, he, he struggles to get the inner door open, you know. So there is a little bit there other than just him holding his breath. And, you know, Teller, yeah, Zed says something that Teller doesn't like. So Teller goes, what? And then Zed starts over saying it. So Teller goes, I heard you. There is at least one too many jokes of the computer taking things literally. You're going to pardon me? No, thanks, lady. Yeah, let's not start making sense here, okay? I, I literally don't know why he says no to that. She has the authority. She's willing to do it. It when end the movie. I, I I don't see why he says no. I, I legitimately don't. The fight, you know, Sato fighting Brennick has its moments. I think that that is the, the time where you most clearly see Sato's martial arts prowess and that yeah you know that's that's cool and and i do like you know they do a good job of making it clear throughout the movie sato is there because he's a sadist he likes hurting people and he took a job as a prison guard so he could get away with it because if he hurts prisoners no one cares you know that's a that's a good bit of yeah and i mean i guess the actor actually is has has some martial arts skill because it looks it looks like the actor's actually doing it and looks impressive you know martial arts is somewhat out of place in a movie about a space prison but yeah there were there were martial arts in a lot of action movies around this time on the 2000s, early to mid 2000s. The pilot doesn't even seem the tiniest bit, I don't know, frustrated or anything. The prisoners are trying to escape. I do like, you know, but in both of these movies, the prison is, you know, like there's there's problems with the prison near the end. And certainly the, the you know, in the first one, the AI has gone haywire. And you have the, ah, what's it called? You know, you've got the, the elevator really quickly descending, for example, with people inside of it. You know, and in this one, the space station is blowing up. And the, the idea of, you know, the, the, let's see, it wasn't a laser gun, I don't think. It was like a, a zap, zappy. Mr. Zappy, he, you know, Teller is going to use Mr. Zappy, I don't know, to hold Earth ransom. I, I wasn't 100% clear on that. He's a bad guy. He, he likes doing bad guy things. Global domination is a bad guy thing, of course. But, I, you know, what what's that saying of, you know, if you... If you dig a grave for someone else, you might fall into it yourself. And which, by the way, was a theme in my easily my favorite childhood Lucky Luke comic book. Anyway, I specify comic book because there's also animated, you know, two D animation films about them. Anyway, yeah. So the the yeah, Brennick, you know uses Mr. Zappy against Teller. That was a very clever, you know, he, 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 yeah, he, he uses it to destroy the, the, the panels for the, the power plant. That was clever. And obviously, if you're flying, if you're 
trying to quickly escape a thing in space, for that thing to be exploding around you and behind you, that makes it more cool. So, you know, that that's obviously much more exciting than if it's just, you know, so, yeah. And it's a testament to how unmemorable the film is overall that I didn't even remember that. Like, I've been preparing for this movie for weeks now. At no point did I remember the, the like, if I hadn't read other people writing that the movie ends, you know, the climax includes an exploding space station, like, that, that should be one of the first things to, to come to mind when thinking of this movie, and somehow it wasn't. So Teller dies because he's fried by accident because the other guy falls down there. It really seems like John should take a more active role in the main villain's death, or the death should have been intentional but at the hands of Zed, like in the first. Nah. One of the one one example of how the movie has is is less edgy than the first is that in the first, by the very end of the movie, only the the two Brennicks are or three by then are still alive. Even though when they when the escape started, there were maybe half a dozen of them. In this one, like. I mean, I didn't count, but I think there might have been a dozen, maybe more. Was... Did I see that right? Was one of the escapees the female guard? Or were all of them... Oh, wait, maybe it was the female pilot. A anyway, it just... Yeah. I'm not saying that... You know, I love movies that are upbeat. But a sequel to Fortress should not be upbeat. Now. Let's see. I guess. Yeah. So, quoting fellow critics here. Also, if you thought the end of the first film was cheesy, then you'll like this even less. Because the ending is even ridiculous by fairy tale standards. 4 out of 10. The action sequences suffer greatly from the malnourished budget. Consider the scene where Lambert tussles, Lambert tussles with a dude wielding a flamethrower. The beginning of this scene has all the makings of the finest flamethrower action since The Exterminator 2, but Things go down the toilet fast, and the scene quickly fizzles out when the guy inexplicably catches himself on fire. That's right, there are no heroics on Lambert's part. The dude burns himself to a crisp just because he's clumsy. That's inexcusable. And... Yeah, so the, the bit with the cockroach going to the office... Yeah, so the, the guy said, I totally didn't understand how they used the mentally disabled guy to gain entry into the office. He remembered the tones of the numbers pressed, but surely a secure system would have would only have one tone for every key. It ain't no bloody telephone. It has his moments of stupidity. The space station has gravity, but does not rotate, although that same fault is used by almost every space set sci-fi film. Shuttles dock with the station as if they were regular planes, and the prisoners are sent into space with spacesuits that don't have tethers. A prisoner manages to wire an optical implant into a cockroach, and those same implants are inserted into the prisoners. Yeah, in, in, into the prisoners' necks, but somehow transmits sensory information to the prison's computer, and actually and. Not you know they end up they end up in the neck, but they actually get implanted into the I want to say thigh. Like I, 
I guess the it was thought to be too ridiculous at the time for an implant to go, you know, like through the back of the head or the or the back of the neck or something. But how how is it more like how is it easier to accept that something implanted in the thigh somehow travels all the way up? And I I got I I get it i see the the part where i think it's on lambert we see that he's like ooh ah oh, you know and and we're seeing like is it a maybe a simulation i, d I don't remember exactly but it, they make it clear that it is moving from the thigh up there so i get that that's supposed to be the explanation but how does it not like <laughs> accidentally cut through blood veins or sever nerves or something along the way like think about how far that is from the inner thigh all the way up to the the back of the neck there's a lot of like ask a surgeon and watch the the you know as as their as their soul dies at hearing how badly their profession has been, like how unrealistically their profession has been represented in a movie with, you know, twelve million dollar budget. Just, just have it be that the actually, I'm not sure that I. Is there a huge problem with having it go in through the mouth again, other than the repetitiveness, but? Like, if it went in through the mouth, and then it, like, got stuck in the throat or something, and sat there, I, th I feel like that would make much more sense. Anyway, still, the action flick path to an escape is never easy. Brennick must withstand one foiled escape bid and consequent time in The Box, a small dome exposed to the sun, with a 24-hour life expectancy. Brennan cooks for more than 31, but is pulled out so that he might continue to pose a threat. A fiery attack from another disgruntled prisoner in circumstances set up by staff. Again, I ask, if they want him dead, then why not just kill him? I, I think they want him to suffer first, though. A run-in with a chess-playing Russian mafia and a meteor shower, just to name a few impediments along the way. And, you know, that's part of the thing, like... The Russians... And the, uh, let me think, yeah, the the Russians, the failed escape attempt, the, the time in the hole, you know, these things don't really, like, I'm not saying it would be easy to edit them out the way it is now, but when they were writing, you know, they might have realized that several of these things just don't really, they don't need to be there. Like, let's see. You know, for comparison, the thing with him being being put in the hole, being punished, that's in the first movie as well. In that one, the punishment actually, like, the, you know, he was basically, like, the, yeah, the reason they eventually that he's eventually no longer being punished is that Karen agrees to live with Poe. You know, so it's this... You know, the, the his character is willing to torture an innocent man, like, okay, guilty of impregnating his wife a second time, because he's lonely. You know, that's... Yeah. Because, you know, he basically doesn't really know how to try to, you know, you know, there are positive ways of getting, you know, someone to spend time with you. You know, the a positive way might be to try to make sure that they enjoy the time they spend with you instead of torturing their loved one you know and and poe actually does think that you know that john is just now completely burnt out and then karen 
manages to restore some of his mind, you know, so, again, much more interesting than, ah, uh, what was it he was being punished for in the first one? I'm struggling to remember. Was it just the, holy crap, if I recall, you know, I watched it a few days ago, and it's not like there's, you know, there are other things, you know, these videos are not my entire life. I have other things I have to think about. And, but yeah, if I recall, he was put in the hole because he refused to execute Maddox. Because Maddox was no longer deemed useful by Poe. So basically, he wanted for Brennick to just... Like, you know, Maddox was barely holding on, so... Basically, what Poe was telling Brennick to do, you know, holding on to the, the platform for the for the drop, Poe was telling Brennick, like, you know, step on his fingers or something, so he lets go and falls to his death. And Brennick says no, and helps Maddox up, so Poe shoots him with the, the gun instead. And then... Because Brennick refused to kill Maddox, he gets thrown in the hole. I forget if they call it that in that movie, but, you know, the, the, ah, what are, what are they always called? A gyroscope, you know. I will grant that the hole is substantially more intense and, and cool and memorable in this movie than in that. But in this, it's a failed escape attempt that, that does it. You know, it's just, I, th I think if in the first movie, if he had tried to escape and gotten caught, they would have killed him possibly on the spot. But here, he, you know, temporary punishment. Like, again, if it wasn't a sequel, then we wouldn't be comparing it, but it is. And they are inviting those comparisons, so. But, but yeah, you know, the... It's just, and also, again, like, Poe's death, like, right before Poe's death, you think, oh, this is going to be the way they get out. You know, he's talking about, Zed, I'm giving a full pardon to these prisoners, let them go. And Zed is like, we do not negotiate in hostage situations. He's like, what? You know, and I think, doesn't she also say you have been terminated or you're, you're fired or something? And then the thing shoots him. And he blows up, we see his skull and all the blue blood and the blue goop everywhere. And so they have to go on to, you know, hack the, the yeah. D-Day has a virus for Zed, which, not sure when he had time to make that, because they don't have a personal computer in, in the cell. Not sure how he got it into, you know, Zed. <laughs> yeah, it was the 90s. Hollywood screenwriters thought that computers were magic, or at least should be in their movies. But, you know, there was... that was substantially more memorable. Like, if you showed me a frame of the explosion of Poe, and you didn't tell me what movie it was from, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to, to tell that that was what it was. It was, it was, yeah, incredibly memorable. And in this, like, he's... Let's see, was it because Sato was knocked into and is like the electricity from the from the high you know the stun gun was set to the highest setting which Sato used to kill Gordon and so it zaps you know don't get me wrong I'm sure that's painful dying by electricity you know the yeah obviously we can't ask someone who's gone through it but you know it is one of the most painful ways painful means of execution but it's just yeah the, the movie severely lacks gore for a sequel to fortress now that yeah that is everything so if you like this video please comment thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now 
I put out one vlog per week reviewing and or sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If. And yeah, currently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you.